Next Chapter Podcasts presents the Play On podcast series, Macbeth. For the best listening experience, be sure to use your headphones or earbuds, and don't forget to wash your hands. the hurly burly's done when the battle's lost and won before the setting of the sun where's the place upon the heath there to meet with macbeth ah! i come ray malkin petta calls soon then fair is foul and foul is fair hover through the fog and filthy air My king. Malcolm questioned that bloody man. He can report by the looks of him all the latest news of the revolt. This is our Thane Macduff. Macduff? Who, like a good and hardy soldier, fought against my captivity. Hail, brave friend. <laughs> Say to the king your knowledge of the battle as you last left it. Doubtful it stood. Like two spent swimmers that do cling together, stealing each other's breath. The merciless MacDonald, a worthy enemy, this rebel, whose villainous nature draws men to follow him, from the Irish Isles brought mercenaries and his own axemen, making fickle fortune smile on his damned death pile like a rebel's whore. <sighs> but t'was too weak for brave Macbeth. Well, he deserves that name. Disdaining fortune with his brandished sword, which still burned with bloody execution, like valor's servant, carved out his passage until he faced that honorless horde without a handshake nor a wish farewell, just ripped them open from entrails to entrance and rammed their heads atop our battlements. Oh, valiant cousin, <laughs> worthy gentleman. And from the east, where the loyal sun rises... Shipwrecking storms and fearful thunders break. So from that spring, where comfort seemed to come, discomfort rises. Huh? Mark. King of Scotland, Mark. Huh. No sooner had justice, armed with valor, compelled these paid soldiers to turn their heels, but Sweno, the Norwegian king, sensing advantage, with replenished weapons and new supplies of men, began a fresh assault. Oh, did this not dismay our captains, Macbeth and Bankwell? <laughs> Lions dread not eagle, sparrow nor hare. In truth, I must report they were like overcharged cannons with double the ammunition. <sighs> they doubly redoubled their efforts against the enemy. <laughs> Unless they meant to swim in their gushing wounds or reenact another crucifixion hill, I couldn't say. <sighs> but I am faint. My gashes cry for help. Your words as well as your wounds show courage. They smack of honor both. <laughs> Go. Go, get him surgeons. My king. Pardon. Who comes here? The worthy Thane of Ross, father. What a frantic look in his eyes. So look those who speak of frightful things. God save the king. 
Where came's from worthy Ross? From Fife, great king, where the Norwegian banners scornfully fly and fan our people cold. Norway's king, with terrifying numbers, assisted by that most disloyal traitor, MacDonald, the Thane of Cawdor, began a deadly conflict. Brave Macbeth, clad in impenetrable armor, point against point, rebellious arm against arm, ravished his unholy spirit, and finally, the victory fell on us! Yes! Yes. (laughs) Praise be to God. (laughs) Great happiness. And now Sweno, the Norwegian king, craves complete accord. Nor would we let him bury his men at St. Columba's Isle until he paid $10,000 for our general use. Ah, no more will that Thane of Carter destroy our deep interests. Pronounce his impending death. And with his former title, now greet Macbeth. I'll see it done. What he has lost, noble Macbeth has won. Where have you been, sister? Killing swine. Sister, and you? A sailor's wife had chestnuts in her lap and munched and munched and munched. Give me, said I. Be gone, witch, the swill-fed swine let cries. Her husband sailed to Aleppo, captain of the tiger. But in a sieve, I'll follow his sail. And like a horny rat without a tail, I'll do, I'll do. I'll do it. I'll give you a wine. (laughs) How kind. And I, another. (laughs) I myself have all the other. Fanned the very ports they blow. And from the places that they know. From their sailing chart. I'll drain him dry as hay. Sleep won't come in night or day. To hang upon his swollen lids cursed, he'll live a man forbid. Not sleeping for nine weeks times nine. He'll dwindle, peak, and then he'll pine. Though his boat will not be lost, still it will be tempest-tossed. Look what I have. Mm, show me. Show me. <laughs> Here I have a captain's thumb, wrecked as homeward. Oh, he did come. Mm, A drum, a drum. Macbeth does come. (laughs) Come, weird sisters, hand in hand. Travelers over sea and land, let us spin about, about. Three to you, three to me. And thrice more times for destiny. Peace. The spell is buzz, buzz, I have not seen a day so fair and foul. How much further to forest? So withered and so wild in their attire, they look not like they walk the earth and yet are on it. Alive? Or are you something that man may not question? You seem to understand me, since you've placed a bony finger upon your skinny lips. You should be women, and yet your beards forbid me from taking you for fair ones. Speak if you can. What are you? All hail, Macbeth. Hail to thee, Thane of Glam. All hail, Macbeth. Hail to you, Thane of Cawdor. Hey ho, Macbeth. That shall be king soon after. (laughs) Good Macbeth, why do you jump and fear things that sound so fair? Tell me true. Are you an illusion? Or that indeed which you outwardly show? Gracefully, you greet my noble partner with great predictions of lordly laurels and royal promise that he is by you enwrapped. But to me, no words. If you can look into the seeds of time and say which grain will grow and which will not, speak then to me, who neither begs nor fears your favors nor your hate. Hey. Hail. Hey. Lesser than Macbeth, but greater. Not so happy, yet much happier. You'll beget kings, but never get a crown. 
So all hail Macbeth and Banquo. Banquo and Macbeth. All hail. All hail. All hail. Stay, you imperfect speakers. Tell me more. I was Thane of Gloms upon my father's death, but how Thane of Cawdor? If that Thane still lives, a prosperous gentleman. And to be king? Simply quite impossible to believe. No more than to be caught, or from where did you gather such strange information? Why, on this bloody heath, do you transfix us with your damn prophecies? Speak, I say. <laughs> the earth has bubbles, as does the water, just like these creatures. To where have they vanished? Into the air. What seemed so solid melted as breath into the wind. Wish they had stayed. But were they really here, those we speak about? Or have we drunk an insane elixir that takes our reason prisoner? Your children shall be kings. Uh, 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 uh. You will be king. <laughs> and Thane of Cawdor, too, didn't they say? <laughs> That's mm. the song they sang us. <laughs> Who's there? The king has happily received Macbeth, the news of your success. And when he heard of your part in this victory against the rebels, he could not separate his great triumph from your own valor, which gave him grateful pause. Then he discovered on that selfsame day you led another defense against the Norwegian army, where, unafraid of death, and as its agent, a massacre you left in your wake. As thick as hail fell man after man and message after message, where all rang Macbeth's praises in this kingdom's great defense and sang them down before him. I am sent to give you thanks for my royal master by ushering you into his sight, not pay you. <laughs> and... In promise of a greater honor, from him he bid me call you Thane of Cawdor. So by this new title, hail, most worthy Thane, for it is yours. What? Can those devils speak true? The Thane of Cawdor lives. Why do you dress me in borrowed robes? Who was the Thane still lives, but he is under judgment for his life which he deserves to lose. Whether he was aligned with Norwegians, or did offer the rebels hidden help or advantage, or with both he worked to wreck his own country, I know not. But his treason, a capital offense, has already been confessed and proved and has overthrown him. Gloms and Thane of Cawdor, the greatest yet to come. Do you not hope your children will be kings, and those that gave me Thane of Cawdor promised them the throne? That... Trusted fully might yet light your way to the crown now that you are Cawdor, but at what price? It is strange how often that to lead us into dire harm, the dark devils and demons tell us truths, fool us with honest trifles to betray us with deepest consequence. Cousin, a word, I pray you. How quickly the king did proclaim this, but how soon will he begin this new role? Soon. Two truths are told as happy prologues to the rising act with royal themes. Cawdor! <laughs> uh, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. All these supernatural predictions cannot be bad, cannot be good. If bad, why did it give me a taste of success by starting with the truth? I am Thane of Cawdor. If good... Why succumb to a suggestion so horrid that my hair does stand on end and makes my steady heart knock at my ribs against the beat of nature? My fears filled with horrible imaginings? My thoughts of murder yet unrealized do now shake my belief in myself, smothering my unborn actions with torturous thoughts, and nothing is but what is not. If chance will make me king, why chance may crown me without my help. Come what may, time moves on even through the roughest day. Look, our partners entranced. <laughs> Worthy Macbeth, we are waiting to serve you. You must forgive me. 
My dull brain was full of things forgotten. Kind gentlemen, your efforts are inscribed where each day I'll see them and remember. Let us go now to the king. Think on what has happened. When we've time, after weighing it all, let's speak freely our hearts to each other. Very gladly. Till then, enough. Come, friends. Ha! Has Carter been executed? Have those fulfilling that duty not returned? Father, they have not as yet come back, but I spoke to one who saw him die, who reported that he openly confessed his treasons, begged your highness pardon, and offered a deep repentance. Nothing in his life became him like the leaving of it. He died as one who is practiced in his own dying, throwing away the dearest thing owned as if it had no meaning. There's no art to know a man's mind from seeing his face. He was a gentleman on whom I built an absolute trust. Hear Macbeth, Thane of Globs, the newly, very newly, worthy Thane of Cawdor, General Banquo, the Thane of Lochaber, and the noble Ross, cousin to Macduff. Hail, hail. A worthiest Macbeth. The sin of my ingratitude even now weighs heavy on me. You are so worthy of a swift reward for your loyalty, but it's slow to come. Had you deserved less, I could repay you in thanks and coin. (laughs) I have only one thing left to say. Your worth is more than all that I can pay. The service and the loyalty I owe pays for itself in doing so. Your Highness' role is to receive our duties, and our duties are to your throne and state. As children and servants, we do all we must to protect your love and honor and to keep your trust. Welcome home now. I have planted you firmly in my soil and will nourish you till you bloom and flourish. (laughs) Noble Banquo, let no one say that you deserve any less for all you have done. Let me embrace you. (laughs) And place you near my heart. Oh, if I grow there, the harvest is yours, sire. (laughs) My abundant joy is shamefully full. Try to hide themselves in sorrow's tears. Son, kinsmen, thanes, and you who are my nearest allies, know we will name as our most worthy heir... Malcolm, our eldest whom we will now call the Prince of Cumberland. May this noble honor be as a star and brightly shine on all those worthy. Now, let's press to Inverness to bind us further to you. Leave the rest to me. I'll be the messenger and make joyful my wife upon hearing of your approach. So humbly... I take my leave. My worthy Carter. The Prince of Cumberland. He is a step on which I must stumble or otherwise leap. Right in my way it lies. Stars, snuff out your light. Do not shine on my dark and deep desires. The eye winks at the hand, but now let it see that what the eye fears is what has to be. True, worthy Banquo. Macbeth's so fully valiant that by praising him I am fed. He is a banquet to me. (sighs) Let's follow him to where he's gone to bid us welcome. He is a peerless kinsman.
If you're a fan of theater, check out the podcasts at Broadway Radio. Broadway Radio creates podcasts for all sorts of theater fans, industry insiders, super fans, people just looking to stay in touch with what is happening in the theater world. Broadway Radio has podcasts for you. Today on Broadway comes out every morning, Monday through Friday, with 20 minutes of news about Broadway and the larger theater community. On Sunday, this week on Broadway is a one-hour show that reviews Broadway, Off-Broadway, and beyond. Broadway Radio also has special shows added into their schedule all the time, so that you never have to go without a theater podcast. Their newest show, This Week in Theater, focuses on theater beyond New York, with reports from all over the U.S. reaching the best of the regions. Their team of 10 hosts will bring you closer to the theater than you have ever been. You can check out all of their shows at broadwayradio.com or wherever you get your podcasts. They met me on the day of our success, and I have learned from their perfect predictions they have more than mere mortal knowledge. When I was was burning burning with desire desire to question question them them further, further, they made themselves air, into which they vanished. As I stood wrapped in wonder, messengers from the king arrived, and all hailed me Thane of Cawdor, just as those (gasps) weird sisters had, before saluting me with Hail King that shall be. Predicting what only time would determine. This I share with you, my dearest partner in greatness. So you do not miss a moment of rejoicing rejoicing in the greatness greatness promised to you. Keep this secret close to your heart and farewell. Gloms you are and Cawdor. And shall be what you've been promised. But I fear your nature too full of the milk of human kindness to do what you must. You would be great and do not lack ambition, but may lack the ruthlessness to further it. What is your right? You want to rightly win. And never would you do the unholy thing and yet would by any means win. You have to do great bloms what now cries to be done to have what you desire. Men do what they most fear to do, even if they will wish it undone. Hurry home, husband, so I may pour my spirits in your ear and melt your doubts with my courageous tongue. Doubts that stop you from pursuit of the crown when fate and mystical forecasts do seem to have already made you king. What news do you bring? The king comes here tonight. You must be mad. Is not your master with him? If he were, he would have warned me to prepare. Please, my lady, it is true. Our thane is coming. Another messenger rode ahead of him who, with almost his last breath, gave me this message for you. Take care of him. He brings great news. (gasps) The raven himself is a horse that croaks the fatal entrance of Duncan under my battlements. You spirits that tend on mortal thoughts, unsex me here and fill me from head to toe to top full of direst cruelty. Make thick my blood, stop its flow, and close the passage to regret so no remorseful visits of nature shake my savage purpose nor keeps me from what I must do. Come to my woman's breasts and drink my milk for bitter courage, you murdering ministers. Come from that place, you formless fiends, await nature's mischief. Come, thick night, and screen your form in the darkest smoke of hell, so my sharp knife sees not the wound it makes, nor heaven peep through the blanket of the dark to cry, hold, hold. Great 
Glum's worthy Cawdor, greater than both by the all hail hereafter. <laughs> Your letter transported me beyond this ignorant present, so now I feel the future in this instant. My dearest love, <sighs> Duncan comes here tonight. And when goes hence? Tomorrow, he proposes. Oh, never will he see tomorrow's sun. <sighs> Your face, my thane, is like a book where men may read strange matters. To beguile the time, act like the time. Bear welcome in your eye, your hand, your tongue. Look like the innocent flower, but be the serpent under it. He that's coming must be provided for, so you just leave the night's great business in my willing hands, which will give all our nights and days to come complete control and dominion. We will speak further. Keep your face clear. To change expression is to show fear. Leave all the rest to me. Ah, this castle is pleasantly placed. The air quickly and sweetly invites oneself to calm the senses. These guests of summer, these purple, temple-haunting little birds, show their love for this home. In heaven's breath, a smell that woos them here. Each jutting frieze, buttress, or corner crevice has been made into a nest and cradle for its young. Here, where they breed and live, I have observed that the air's delicious. Oh, see, here's our honored hostess. The love bestowed us has caused you trouble, for which we thank you with love. Oh, we will offer you thanks to God for your pains and thank you for your trouble. All our service, even if twice done and then done double, could not be equal service when compared to all the honors deep and broad with which your majesty fills our house. <laughs> for the past and the present dignities bestowed us, we owe you prayers. <sighs> Where's the Thane of Cawdor? We race close behind him with the sole purpose of helping him with this evening's preparations, but mm. he rides well. <laughs> and his love of you, sharp as a spur, helped him arrive home before us. <laughs> Fair and noble hostess, we are your guests tonight. Ever your servants, we make ourselves, along with our accounts, available for your highness's pleasure to mm. use as your own. Mm. Mm. Give me your hand. Take me to our host. We love him dearly and will extend our praise to him. If you please, hostess. If it were done, when it is done, then it were well it were done quickly. If the assassination could reign in the consequence and seize with his ceasing success, but that this blow might be the be-all and the end-all here, then here, from this shore to shallow of time, we'd jump o'er the life to come. But in these cases, we still must be judged. And so we teach bloody lessons here, which once taught return to haunt the teacher. Even-handed justice moves the ingredient from our poisoned chalice to our own lips. He's here in double trust. Firstly, I'm his kinsman and his subject. Strong cause not to kill. Then as his host, should shield my guests from murderers at my door, not bear the knife myself. Besides, this Duncan has borne his king's power humbly has been so fair in his great office that his virtues will plead like angels trumpet-tongued against the deep damnation of his being oft and pity like a naked newborn babe bursting into life or heaven's cherubims soaring upon the unseen couriers of the air will blow the horrid deed in every eye the tears will drown the wind 
have no spur to prick the sides of my intent, but only vaulting ambition, which jumps over itself and falls on the other. What now? What news? He's near done supping. Why did you leave the table? <sighs> has he asked for me? Of course he has. We will proceed no further in this business. He has honored me of late, and I've gained glowing opinions from all sorts of people. And these I'll wear now. My newest garments, not cast aside so soon. Are your hopes drunk with which you dressed yourself? Have they slept since and wake right now, looking so green and pale, made sick by what they once longed for freely? From now on, I will question your love. Can you be as fierce in action and valor as you are in desire? Would you have what you esteemed as the crowning glory of life or live a coward in your own esteem, letting I dare not come before I will like a fish-loving cat who dare not wet its feet? Pray peace. I dare do all that does befit a man who dares do more is none. What beast was it then that made you break to me this venture? When you dare do it, then you were a man. But to be much more than you were only doing makes a better man. Not time nor place seemed quite so right, but now you've made them both. They are ready now. Now that readiness does unmake you. I have suckled babes. Know how tender it is to love the babe that milks me. But while it was smiling in my face, I'd have plucked my nipple from his boneless gums and bashed his brains out, had I so sworn as you have done to this. If we should fail? We fail. But screw your courage to the sticking place and we'll not fail. When Duncan is asleep, brought on quickly... As his day's long journey soundly invites his two chambermen with wine and wassail, I will so convince that memory, the warden of the brain, will be fumes, and the receipt of all reason only a trickle. When in swinish sleep their wine-drenched souls lie as if in death, what cannot you and I perform upon the unguarded Duncan, and then cast blame on his drink-soaked officers wearing the guilt of our great kill? Bring forth men children only, for your unflinching spirit should conceive nothing but males. <laughs> Will it not be received once we have marked with blood those two sleepy chambermen and used their very own daggers that they have done it? Who dares receive otherwise, as we will make our grief and outcries roar upon his death? I am resolved and offer every bit of my body to this terrible feat. Go now. And mock this time with a sweet show. False face must hide what the false heart doth know. Our brave Macbeth's begun the flood. The water's rising thick with blood. His lady drags him to his stream. No one stops her, someone screams. What's the time, Fleance? The moon has set. I have not heard the clock. And she goes down at twelve? I take it. Tis late, father. <laughs> Here, take my sword. Heaven is thrifty tonight. Its candles all burnt out. Take dagger two. <clears throat> a heavy summons lies like lead upon me, and yet I cannot sleep. A merciful angels, keep away the cursed thoughts that plague me in my sleep. Give me my sword. Who's there? A friend. <sighs> What, sir, not yet asleep? Mm -hmm. The king's in bed. He has been unusually joyful and sent great gifts for your household. With this diamond, he greets your wife, such a kind hostess, granting his boundless gratitude. Being unprepared, our welcome was subject to shortcomings without which would have served him better. All is well, son. To bed. I will soon join. Yes, da. <laughs> Last night, I... Dreamt of the three weird sisters. They have showed you some truth. I think not of them, but 
When we can uncover an hour to spare, we could speak some words upon this business, if you would grant me the time. But any time that pleases you. If you will bring honor to my opinion, it shall bring honor to you. So I lose none in seeking to increase it, and still keep my heart true and free and my loyalty clear. I will listen to you. Hmm. Meanwhile, sleep well. Thanks, sir. The like to you. Is this a dagger which I see before me? The handle toward my hand? Come, let me clutch thee. I have thee not, and yet I see thee still. Fatal vision, art thou not meant to be held as firmly as seen? Or art thou but a dagger of the mind, a false creation conjured by a feverish inflamed brain? Still, I see thee seeming as deadly real. As this, which now I draw, thou ushers me further down that fatal path. The self-same instrument I was to use, huh? <laughs> Do the other senses make mine eyes foolish, or are they wiser than the rest? I still see thee, and on thy blade and thy hilt, drops of blood, which was not so before. <sighs> There's no such thing. It is the bloody business bidding this vision to mine eyes. Now, where half the world sleeps as sound as the dead, nightmares poison that curtain sleep, foul witchcraft honors moon pale Hecate, pushes old man murder warned by his watchman the wolf, whose howl speeds him with a stealthy pace and a rapist's stride to his ravished goal in ghostly silence. Thou, sure and firm set earth, hear not my steps, which way they walk, for fear thy stones will whisper of my whereabouts, and take away the horror of surprise which suits the time. While I speak he lives, words blown cold cool the heat, the deed gives. I go. And it is done. The bell invites me. Hear it not, Duncan. For its death knell will summon thee to heaven or to hell. <sighs> the wine that made them drunk has made me bold. What has quenched them has lit me on fire. Hark! It was the owl that shrieked. A fatal bellman which gives the final good night. He is about it. The doors are open and the gluttonous grooms shirk their duties with snores. I have drugged their drinks, so now death and nature battle o'er them whether they live or die. Who's there? Who's there? Oh no, I'm afraid they have awakened and tis not done. The attempt and not the deed confounds us. Listen, I laid their daggers ready. He could not miss them. Had Duncan not resembled my father as he slept, I had done it. <laughs> my husband? I have done the deed. Did you hear nothing? I heard the owl scream and the crickets cry. Did you not speak? When? Now. As I descended. I. This is a sorry sight. A foolish thought to say a sorry sight? One groom did laugh in his sleep as the other cried murder, so waking each other. I stayed and listened, but they just said their prayers and lulled themselves back to sleep. They are both lodged together. One cried, God bless us, and amen, amen the other when they saw my bloody hangman's hands. Hearing their fear, I could not say amen, amen when they did say God bless us. Do not dwell on it so deeply. But why? Could I not pronounce amen? I needed a true blessing, but amen stuck in my throat. You must not think these thoughts. If you do, these deeds will make us mad. <clears throat> Methought I heard a voice cry, Sleep no more. <laughs> Macbeth's murder sleep. The innocent sleep. Sleep 
that knits back together our unraveled cares, that brings death to each day, works soothing bath, a balm for our troubled minds, great nature's main course, nourishing life's feast. What do you mean? Still, it cried, sleep no more. Throughout the house, drums have murdered sleep, and therefore Cawdor shall sleep no more. Macbeth will sleep no more. Who was it that thus cried? Uh, My worthy Thane, you do deform your noble strength to think of such brain sickly things. Go, get some water to wash this filthy witness from your hand. And why did you bring these daggers from the place? They must stay there. Go, carry them and smear the sleeping rooms with blood. I'll go no more. I'm afraid to think of what I've done. Look on it again. I dare not. Men are weak. Give me the daggers. The sleeping and the dead are as harmless as pictures. Only the eye of a child fears a painted devil. If he still bleeds... I'll gild red gold the faces of the grooms, for it must show their guilt. <gasps> From where's that knocking? <sighs> What's wrong with me? When every noise appalls me. <sighs> Whose hands are these? <laughs> they pluck out mine eyes. Will all great Neptune's ocean wash this blood clean from my hands? Now, my hands will so stain the deep and infinite seas incarnadine, making the green one red. My hands are stained like yours, but it had shame me to have a heart so white with fear. I hear a knocking at the south entry. Let us retire to our chamber. A little water washes us of this deed. How easy it was then. Your disarming fear has left you unguarded. Hark! More knocking. Get on your night clothes, lest someone greet us and prove us to be sleepless night watchmen. Be not lost in pain-filled thoughts. To know my deed, twere best not know myself. Wake, Duncan, with thy knocking. I wish thou couldst. Next Chapter Podcast is proud to present the Play On Podcast series, King Lear. I'll stand in honor of the royal family. Starring Keith David. Our most dear and honored King Lear. In a new modern English verse translation by Marcus Gardley. Tell me, dearest daughters, which of you shall say she loves me most? You did not obey our father and therefore deserve the punishment handed down to you. Hear Shakespeare's epic tragedy performed by some of the most accomplished actors of our time. Only the grave now can bring me peace. Go to playonpodcast.com to learn more. There's a sickness that comes with age. Anyone can see how this world works. Just look with your ears. Have a splendid life. Indeed! If a man were a porter of Hell Gate, he should have plenty of key turning to do here. Knock, knock, knock. Who in the name of Beelzebub is there? <gasps> Here's a greedy farmer who tripled his prices, then hanged himself when the grain became cheap. Ooh! 
come in, Father Time. Have handkerchiefs about you, for here you'll sweat like hell. <laughs> Knock, knock. Who's there in the devil's other name? Faith. Here's a lawyer who could swear against the scales of justice on either side, who lied enough for God's sake, yet could not lie to God. Oh, come in, Father Equivocator. <laughs> Knock, knock, knock. Who's there? Faith! Here's a dodgy English tailor. Come hither for stealing the crotch from a French panty. Come in, tailor. Here, you may cook your carrot. <laughs> <laughs> knock, knock. Never stays quiet. What are you? But this place is too cold for hell. I'll devil porter it no more. I had thought to have let in some from all professions that go down the primrose path to the devil's everlasting bone fire. <laughs> Let us in! Anon! Anon! Let me come! <laughs> I pray you, remember the porter. <laughs> Was it so late, friend, before you went to bed that you do delay so long? <laughs> <laughs> Faith, sir, we were carousing till a second cock crows. <laughs> and drink, sir, is a great provoker of three things. What three things does drink especially provoke? Oh, why, sir, bright red nose painting, deep sleep, and your eyes. Oh. <laughs> now, let's hurry. It provokes and unprovokes. It provokes the desire, but it takes away the performance. Therefore, much drink may be said to be an equivocator with lechery. It makes him and it mars him. It sets him on and takes him off. It persuades him and disheartens him, makes him stand to and not stand to. In conclusion, equivocates him into laying and giving him the lie, leaves him. I believe Drick gave thee the lie last night. <laughs> <laughs> that it did, sir. It gripped me by the throat. But I threw him up for his lie. And I think being too strong for him, though he took my legs from under me, yet I made a shift to cock him out. <laughs> <laughs> is thy master stirring? There he is. Our knocking has awakened him. Here he comes. Good morrow, noble sir. Good morrow, both. Is the king stirring? Worthy thane. Not yet. He did command me to call on him early. I've almost missed the hour. I'll bring you to him. I know this is a joyful trouble to you, but yet tis one. Ah, the labor we delight in pacifies pain. <laughs> this is the door. I must be so bold to call, for my time here is appointed. <laughs> Goes the king hence today? He does. He did expect to. <sighs> the night has been unruly. Where we lay, our chimneys were blown down, and as they say, lamentings heard in the air, strange screams of death and prophesying with terrible sounds, dreadful commotions and confused events. Newly hatched by woeful nature, an owl clamored the live long night. Some say the earth was feverish and did shake. Twas a rough night. My young remembrance has no memory to parallel it. Oh, horror. 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 Tongue nor heart cannot conceive nor name thee. 
Well, what's, what's the matter? matter? Confusion now hath made his masterpiece. Most sacrilegious murder hath broke ope the Lord's anointed temple and stolen thence the life of the building. What is you say? The life? Mean you his majesty? Enter his chamber and shatter your sight with a new monster. Do not bid me speak. See, and then speak yourselves. Awake! Awake! Ring the alarm bell, murder and treason! Banquo! Malcolm, awake! Shake off this downy sleep, death's imposter, and look on death itself. Up, up, and see the last judgment's form. Malcolm, Banquo! As from your graves, rise up and walk like ghosts to aptly face this horror. Ring the bell! What's the business that such a hideous trumpet calls to alarm the sleepers of the house? Speak! Speak! Oh, gentle lady, tis not for you to hear what I must speak. The repetition in a woman's ear would murder her to know it. Oh, Banquo! Banquo! Our royal master's murdered! <gasps> Alas! What? In our house? D too cruel anywhere! Dear Duff, I pray thee contradict thyself and say it is not so. Had I but died an hour before this chance, I had lived a blessed life. For from this instant there's nothing serious in mortality. All is but toys. Renown and grace is dead. The wine of life is drained and the mere dregs are left for bitter boasting. What is amiss? You are Malcolm and do not know it. The spring... The head, the fountain of your blood is stopped. The very source of it is stopped. Your royal father's murdered. <sighs> no. By whom? His two chambermen, it would seem, had done it. Their hands and faces were all badged with blood. So were their daggers, which unwiped, we found upon their pillows. They stared, gripped by madness. No man's life was to be trusted with them. <sighs> Yet I do repent me of my fury that I did kill them. Why did you do so? Who can be wise, amazed, temperate and furious, loyal and neutral in such a moment? No man. The swift voyage of my violent love outran that pauser, reason. Here lay Duncan, his silver skin laced with his golden blood and his gashed stabs like sweet nature broken open for ruin's wasteful entrance. There, the murderers steeped in the colors of their trade, their daggers, now cowards' tools, breached with gore. Who'd refrain that had a heart to love and in that heart courage to kill for love? Heaven help me! Oh! My lady! Oh, my to the lady. No, 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 no. Why do I hold my tongue so they may claim I put them up to it? What can be spoken here where my fate hid in a witch's eye may blink and seize me? I'll away. My tears are not yet brewed, nor my strong sorrow for my father ready to be expressed. Look to the lady! And when our hearts and bodies are shielded from painful exposure, let us meet and question this most bloody piece of work to know it further. Fears and doubts shake us. In the great hand of God I stand, and thence, against the yet unknown motives, I fight to right treason's malice. And so do I. So all. Oh. Let's briefly put on manly readiness, and once armed... I'll meet in the hall. Agreed. Agreed. What will I do? I'll not unite with them. To show an unfelt sorrow is a task which the false man does easy. I'll to England. This murderous shaft that shot has not yet landed, and my safest way is to avoid the aim. Therefore, to horse, and I'll be robust in my leave-taking. Quick slip away. There's warrant in that theft which steals itself when there's no mercy left. Yeah. Here within all my young time I have seen hours dreadful and things strange, but this sore night has beaten former knowings. Ah, good Lennox. Thou sees the heavens as troubled with man's act threatens his bloody stage. By the clock, tis day, and yet dark night strangles sun's warm light. Is it night's great power, 
or day's dire shame, that Duncan's dark death does the earthen tomb when light should kiss it awake. Tis unnatural, even like the deed that's done. On Tuesday last, a falcon soaring in her place of pride was stalked and killed by a mouse-hunting owl. And Duncan's horses, a thing most strange and certain, beauteous and swift, the favored of their race, turned wild in nature, broke their stalls, flung out rebelling against obedience as if they'd make war with mankind. Tis said they ate each other. They did so <gasps> to the amazement of mine eyes that looked upon. Here comes the good Macduff. How goes the world, sir, now? Can you not see? Is known who did this more than bloody deed? Those that Macbeth have slain. Oh, wretched day. What good could they pretend? None. They were paid. Malcolm, the king's own son, is stolen away and fled, which puts upon him suspicion of the deed. Against nature still. Greedy ambition that will devour its own source of life. Then tis likely the sovereignty will fall upon Macbeth. He is already named, and gone to Schoon to be invested for coronation. Where's Duncan's body? Carried to Combkill, the sacred storehouse of his predecessors and guardian of their bones. Will you to Schoon? No, cousin. I'll to Fife. Well, I will go to Schoon. Well, may you see things well done there. Adieu, lest our old rule prove easier than our new. Farewell, Lennox. God's blessing go with you, and with those that would make good of bad and friends of foes. all as the weird women promised, and I fear you played most foully for it. Yet it was said it should not crown your future heirs, but that myself should be the root and father of many kings. If there come truth from them as upon you, Macbeth, their speeches shine. Why, by the verities on you made true, may they not be my oracles as well, and raise my royal hopes? But hush, no more. Here's our chief guest. If he had been forgotten, it had been as a gap in our great feast, a thing all too unbecoming. Tonight we hold a stately supper, sir, and I'll request your presence. Let your highness command me. As it is to you, my duties are with a most indissoluble tie, forever knit. <laughs> Ride you this afternoon? Aye, my good lord. We should have else desired your good advice, which is, as always, both grave and prosperous in today's council, but we'll wait till morrow. Is it far your ride? As far, my lord, as will fill up the time twixt this and supper. If my horse goes not faster, I may become a borrower of the night for a dark hour or two. Fail not our feast. My lord, I will not. Oh, we hear our bloody cousin Malcolm ran off, lodged in England, not confessing his cruel patricide, filling his hearers with invented tales. But of that tomorrow, when besides we will speak matters of state concerning both... Hi, you to horse. Adieu. Till you return at night. Goes Fleance with you? Aye, my good lord. Our time does call upon us. I wish your horses swift and sure of foot. And so I do deliver you to their backs. Farewell. Let every man be master of his time till seven tonight to give our guests the sweeter welcome. We keep to ourself alone till supper time. My lord. God be with you. Uh... Here, boy. A word with you. Await those men our pleasure. Uh, they do, my lord, outside the palace gate. Bring them before us. To be crowned is nothing but to be safely so. Our fears in Banquo stick deep, and in his most royal nature reigns that which would be feared. Tis much he dares, and to that dauntless temper of his mind he hath a wisdom that doth guide his valor to act in safety. He is the one man whose being I do fear, and under him my guiding spirit is rebuked, as Mark Antony's was by Caesar. He scoffed when those spirits spun the name of king on me and bade them speak to him. 
and prophet-like, they hailed him father to a line of kings. Upon my head, they placed a childless crown and put a barren scepter in my grip, thence to be wrenched with an unlineal hand, no son of mine succeeding. If it be so, for Banquo's issue have I fouled my mind. For them, the gracious Duncan, have I murdered, placed bitter hate in my vessel of peace. Only for them, and my immortal soul given to Satan, man's common enemy to make them kings, the seeds of Banquo, kings. Rather than so, come, fate, into the fray, and champion me even to my death. Who's there? My lord. Now, go to the door. Stay there till we call. Was it not yesterday we spoke together? It It was. was. So please, please, your highness. highness. Well then, now have you considered what I have said? Know that it was he in the times past which made you so unfortunate, which you thought had been my innocent self. This I made good to you in our last conference proved beyond a doubt to you how he made you believe his false promises, how betrayed the tools he used to shape them and all things else that might make a half-wit and a mind half-crazed say, thus did Banquo. You made it known to us. I did so and went further, which is now the point of this second meeting. Does your patience... So prevail over your nature that you would let this go? Does your gospel preach you pray for this good man and his child, whose heavy hand hath bent you early to your grave, made your kin beggars forever? We are men, my liege. Aye, in the catalog, you go for men. As hounds and greyhounds, mongrels, spaniels, curs, shags, water rugs, and demi-wolves are called all by name of dogs. But the list of worth distinguishes the swift, the slow, the subtle, the housekeeper, the hunter. Every one according to the gift which bounteous nature hath thus bound him, whereby he does receive particular merits from that docket that writes them all alike. And so of men. Now, if you have earned a place in that file, not in the worst rank of manhood, let's say, then I will plant that business in your bosoms whose execution takes your enemy off, clutches you to the heart and love of us, who wear our health uncertain in his life, which in his death were perfect. I am one, my liege. Whom the vile blows and beatings of the world hath been so enraged that I am reckless what I do to spite the world. And I another, so weary with disasters, mauled by fortune, that I would set my life on any chance to mend it or to help end it. Both of you know Banquo is your enemy. True, my lord. So is he mine, and in such bloody discord that every minute of his being thrusts against all that lets me live. And though I could, with barefaced power, crush him into dust, and with my crown assert it, yet I must not. For certain friends that are both his and mine, whose loves I may not drop, will mourn his fall, who I myself struck down. So here is why I am making love to your assistance, masking the business from the public eye, For sundry weighty reasons. We shall, my lord, perform what you command us. Though our lives... Your bravery shines through you. Within this hour, at most, I will advise you where to plant yourselves, acquaint you with the perfect place to spy the perfect moment. For it must be done tonight. And some ways from the palace, keep in mind that I must keep clear from blame. And with him... To leave no trace nor botches in the work. Fleance, his son, that keeps him company, whose absence is as important to us as is his father's, must embrace the fate of that dark hour. Go now. Resolve yourselves. I'll come to you soon. <laughs> we are resolved, my lord. I'll call on you shortly. Go wait inside. It is concluded. Banquo... Thy soul's flight, if it find heaven, must find it out 
tonight. Is Banquo gone from court? I, madam, but returns again tonight. Oh, say to the king, I await him when he pleases for a few words. Madam, I will. Next Chapter Podcasts is proud to present the Play On podcast series, Pericles. Young Prince of Tyre, these skulls belonged to princes like yourself. They say give up before you're just like them. In a new modern English verse translation by Ellen McLaughlin. My life's at stake. Here's Shakespeare's timeless tale about a man who loses everything only to find what matters most. Subscribe, rate and review, play on podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Go to playonpodcast.com to learn more. I still need a pair of pants. (laughs) Well... We can get you some. We can make a pair out of my best shirt. Nothing's gained, all spent, when desire's attained without content. Tis safer to be him which we destroy than by destruction dwell in doubtful joy. How now, my lord? Why keep you to yourself? Your companions are inventing some sorry stories using those thoughts which should have died with the dead to doubt us. Things without remedy should be without regard. What's done is done. We have slashed the snake, not killed it. She'll heal and be herself whilst our poor misdeeds remain in danger of her former bite. Better the universe fracture so both heaven and earth suffer rather than eat our meals in fear and sleep in the affliction of these terrible dreams that shake us nightly. Better to be with the dead, whom we, to gain our peace, have sent to peace, than to torture our minds as they are pulled apart into sleepless frenzy. Duncan, in his grave, after life's fitful fever, sleeps well. Treason has done his worst, not steel, not poison, not his countrymen's hate, nor foreign armies. Nothing can touch him further. (laughs) Come on, calm down, my lord. Smooth over your rough looks. Be bright and jovial among your guests tonight. So shall I, love. And so, I pray, will you let your attention apply to Banquo. Treat him with esteem of both eye and tongue. In these unsafe times, we must now wash our honors in these flattering streams and make our faces calm masks to our hearts, disguising what they are. You must stop this. (sighs) Full of scorpions is my mind, dear wife. Thou knowst that Banquo and his fleance lives. Yes, but nature has not made them immortal. There's comfort yet. They are assailable. Then be joyful. Before the bat has flown his cloistered flight, before the dung beetle with his drowsy hums has rung night's yawning bell at Black Hecate's summons, there shall be done a deed of dreadful note. What's to be done? Be innocent of the knowledge, dearest Chuck, till thou applaud the deed. Come, sown tight night. Inveil the tender eye of pitiful day, and with thy bloody and invisible hand cancel and tear to pieces that moral bond which keeps me pale. Night thickens, 
and the crow makes wing to his rooky wood, good things of day begin to droop and drowse, whilst night's black agents their praise do rouse. <gasps> Thou marvelst at my words, but hold thee still. Things bad begun are made stronger by ill, so please, I pray, stand with me today. West yet glimmers with some shrieks of day. Thou spurring on the belated traveler to speed to the castle, and near approaches the subject of our watch. Hark, I hear horses. Uh, give us a light there. Mm, then tis he. The rest on the list of invited guests are already there. His horses go about. Almost a mile with the grooms, usually. But all men do, from hence to palace gate, walk along here. A light, a light. Tis he. Step to it. Hmm. It will be rain tonight. Yes, da. Let it come down. Ah! Ah! Oh, treachery. Father, father. Fly, good fly out. Fly, fly, fly. Thou must revenge. Ah! No. Oh, slave. Ah! Who did strike out the light? What's not the plan? There is but one down. The sun is fled. We have lost best half of our affair. Well, let's away and say how much is done. Hail to your grace! Hail to Scotland! <laughs> you know your earned places. Sit down. To one and all, a hearty welcome. Thanks, Thanks to your majesty. majesty. Ourself will mingle with society and play the humble host. Our hostess keeps her throne, but now we will require her give you welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Proclaim it for me, sir, to all our friends. For my heart speaks, they are welcome. <laughs> you see, they encounter thee with their heart's thanks. Well, both sides are even here. I'll sit in the midst. Enjoy yourselves. Soon we'll drink a toast around the table. <laughs> There's blood upon thy face. Tis Banquo's then. Tis better outside you than inside him. Is he dispatched? My lord, his throat is cut. That I did for him. Thou art the best of the cutthroats, yet bester who did the like for Fleance. If thou didst it, thou art the non pareil My royal sir, Fleance escaped. <laughs> then comes my fit again. I had else been perfect... Whole as the marble, firm set as the rock, as free and untethered as the flowing air. But now I am cabined, cribbed, confined, bound by brazen doubts and fears. But Banquo safe? Aye, my good lord, safe in a ditch he bides, with twenty drenched gashes on his head, each one a death to nature. Thanks for that. There the grown serpent lies. That worm that's fled hath nature that in time will venom breed, but hath no teeth for now. Get thee gone. Tomorrow we'll speak together again. My royal lord, you did not give the toast. The feast is frigid that is not plainly pledged while in the making. Without this welcome, twere best to feed at home. From thence the sauce to meet is ceremony. Meetings are bare without it. Sweet remembrance, sir. Now good digestion attend appetite and health on both. <laughs> May it please your highness, sit. Under one roof we would have all our honor were the graced person of our Banquo present, who I only hope to scold for unkindness, not mourn for his misfortune. <laughs> his absence, sir, proves his broken promise. Would your highness please grace us with your royal company? Oh, the table's full. Here is a place reserved, sir. Where? Here, my good lord. <gasps> what is that moves your highness? 
Which of you have raised this bloody memory? What, my good lord? Thou cannot say I did it. Never shake thy gory locks at me! Gentlemen, rise. His highness is not well. Sit, worthy friends. My lord is often thus and hath been from his youth. Pray you, keep seat. The fit is momentary. Soon enough he will be well again. Take no note of him. You shall offend him and extend his outburst. Eat and regard him not. Are you a man? Ay, and a bold one that dare look on that, which might appall the devil. Oh, such nonsense. This is the very painting of your fear. This is the air-drawn dagger that you said led you to Duncan. Oh, these fits and starts, impostors to true fear, would well become a woman's story at a winter's fire authorized by her grandmom. Shame itself. Why do you make such fear? Faces, when all's done, you look but on a chair. Pretty see there, behold. Look how say you, bloody Banquo. <sighs> Why, what care I if thou cannot speak to? If bone filled vaults and graves must send those we bury back, the bellies of praying birds become their monuments. <gasps> what? Quite unmanned in folly. As I stand here, I saw him. Fie for shame. Blood hath been shed from now to olden times. Though humane laws made a civilized state, we still have savage murders being dispatched, too terrible for the ear. The time has been that when the brains were out, the man would die, and there's an end. But now they rise again with twenty lethal lashes on their heads and push us from our chairs. This is more strange than such a murder is. My worthy lord, your noble friends await you. I do forget. Do not muse at me, my most worthy friends. I have a strange infirmity, which is nothing to those that know me. Come, love and health to all. Then I'll sit down. Give me some wine. Fill full. <laughs> I drink to the general joy of the whole table and to our dear friend Banquo, whom we miss, would he were here. To all and him we thirst, and all to all, our, our duties, duties and, and the pledge. pledge. Thou hast it now, Macbeth. Be gone and quit my sight. Let the earth hide thee. Thy bones are marrowless, thy blood is cold. Thou hast no speculation in those eyes with which thou dost glare. Think of this good peers but as a thing of custom. Tis no other, only it spoils the pleasure of the time. What man dare, I dare. Approach thou like the rugged Russian bear, the armed rhinoceros or fierce hurricane tiger. Take any shape but that, and my firm nerves shall never tremble or be alive again. And dare me to the desert with thy sword. If trembling is my habit, then pronounce me a girl's baby doll. Hence, horrible shadow, unreal mockery. Go. Go! Why, so being gone, I'm a man again. Pray you sit still. You have ruined the mirth, broke the good meeting with most amazing disorder. Can such things be and overcome us like a summer's cloud without our special wonder? You make me doubt my own true character and nature, when now I think you can behold such sights and keep the natural ruby of your cheeks when mine is blanched with fear. What sights, my lord? Uh, I pray you, speak not. He grows worse and worse. Questions enrage him. At once, good night. Stand not upon the order of your going, but go at once. Good night, my liege. Good night, and better health attend his majesty. A good night to all. will have blood. They say blood will have blood. Stones have been known to move and trees to speak. 
Prophecies by those who know connections have, by magpies and crows and rooks, revealed the secretest murderer. What is the night? Almost at odds with morning. Which is which? Why dost thou think Macduff denies his presence at our great bidding? Did you send to him, sir? Mm -mm. I heard it spoken, but I will send note. There's no servant to spare, but in his house I keep a watchman paid. I will tomorrow go early to meet with the weird sisters. More shall they speak, for now I am bent to know in the worst way, the worst. For mine own good, nothing shall halt my way. I am in blood steeped so far that should I wait no further, returning where as bloody... As crossing over. <laughs> Strange things I have in head that will to hand, which must be acted ere they may be scanned. You lack the season of all natures. Sleep. Come, will to sleep. My strange and self-abuse is the novice's fear that lacks hard use. We are yet but young indeed. How now, Hecate? You look angrily. Have I not reason, hag-rags that you are? Saucy and overbold. How did you dare to trade and traffic with Macbeth in riddles and affairs of death? And I, the mistress of your charms, the closed contriver of all harms, was never called to bear my part or show the glory of our art. And which is worse, all you have done hath been but for a wayward son. But make amends now. Get you gone at the mouth of Hell's Acheron. Meet by that river. Thither he will come to know his destiny. Your vessels and your spells provide. Your charms and everything beside. Flying, this night I'll spend weaving a dismal and a fatal end. He shall spurn fate, scorn death, and bear his hopes of wisdom, grace, and fear. And as you know, security is mortal's greatest enemy. The queen, come for the sun doth rise, will taste your lips and kiss your side. The queen, come when the moon. Red-toothed creatures drink your dew. Hark! I am called. My little spirit, see, sits in a foggy cloud and waits for me. Come, let's make haste. She'll soon be back again. <laughs> <laughs> My former speeches have but touched your thoughts, which I can interpret farther. I say things have been strangely born. The gracious Duncan was pitied by Macbeth after he was dead. And the right valiant Banquo walked after dark. Whom you may say, if it please you, Flayon skilled. For Flayon's fled. Men must not walk too late. Who cannot lack the thought how monstrous it was for Malcolm to kill his gracious father? Damned fact! How it did grieve Macbeth! Did he not just in pious rage tear through two of Duncan's grooms that were the slaves of drink enthralled with sleep? Was that not nobly done? Aye, and wisely too, for twould have angered angered any heart alive to hear those men deny it. So that I say he has done all things well, and I do think that, had he Duncan's son under his key, and if it please heaven he shall not, then Malcolm should know father killing consequences. So should Fleance. True enough. From blunt words, and cause he failed his presence at the tyrant's feast, I hear Macduff lives in disgrace. Sir, can you tell where he hides himself? Duncan's son Malcolm, from whom Macbeth has stole his true birthright, lives in the English court and is received by the pious King Edward with such grace that the malevolence of fortune cannot take away his high respect. And there, Macduff is gone to beg the Holy King 
to wake Northumberland in warlike Seward, and by this allegiance with God above, to ratify the work we may again give to our tables meat, sleep to our nights, do faithful homage and receive free honors, all which we pine for now. And this report hath so exasperated Macbeth that he prepares for some attempt at war. Sent he to Macduff? He did, and with an absolute. Sir, not I. The scowling messenger turns his back and hums as if to say, you'll rue the time you gave me this answer. And that well might advise him to keep what distance from Scotland his wisdom provides. May a swift angel fly to the court of England and unfold the blessed message that he quickly return to this our suffering country and free us from Macbeth's accursed hand. I would send my prayers to him. And I to Scotland. Who prays to whom on purple heave and moon is full, we see Macbeth. He carries secrets in his veins. Let's pierce his skin and stroke his brains. Thrice the mottled cat hath mewed. Twice and once the hedgehog whined. My magpie cries, tis time, tis time. <laughs> Next Chapter Podcast is proud to present the Play On Podcast series, A Midsummer Night's Dream. <laughs> A new modern English verse translation by Jeff Witte. That will ask <gasps> for some tears in the true performing of it. Hear Shakespeare's comic masterpiece about lovers. For love looks not with eyes, but with the mind. Royals. Regard your father as a god. Players. My chief talent is for a tyrant. And fairies, whose worlds are all turned upside down and right side up by powers beyond their control. Go to playonpodcast.com to learn more. Don't make me play a woman. I have a beard. Growing. Praise to whom on purple heath when moon is full we see Macbeth. He carries secrets in his face. Let's pierce his skin and stroke his pains. <gasps> Tis time! Tis time. Double, double, toil and trouble, fire, burn, and cauldron bubble. Double, double, toil and trouble, fire, burn, and cauldron bubble. Round about the cauldron go, in the poison entrail throw. Told that under cold stone, days and nights as thirty-one. Oozing venom, sleeping gut, boil the first in the charmed pot. Double, double toil and trouble, fire, burn and cauldron bubble. Double, double toil and trouble, fire, burn and cauldron bubble. Fillet of a forest snake, in the cauldron boil and bake. Eye of newt and toe of frog, whirl of bat and tongue of dog. Adder's frock and blindworm sting, lizard's legs and owlet's wing. For a charm of powerful trouble, like a hell broth boil and bubble. Double, double toil and trouble, fire, burn and cauldron bubble. Double, double, toil and trouble, fire, burn and cauldron bubble. Pale dragon tooth of wolf, witch's mummy craw and gulf, of the glutted salty shark, root of hemlock, dug in the dark, liver of blasphemer too, gall of goat and slips of you, slithered in the moon's eclipse, heathen's nose and liar's lips. Finger of birth strangled maid, ditch delivered by a jade. Make the gruel thick with gore. Add thereto a tiger's organ for the ingredients of our cauldron. Double, double toil and trouble. Fire burning cauldron bubble. Double, double toil and trouble. Fire burning cauldron bubble. Who 
bullets with a baboon's blood, then the charm is firm and good. <laughs> Commend your pains, and everyone shall share the gains. And now, about the cauldron sing, like elves and fairies in a ring, and chanting all that you put in. Sisters, gather round the Hecate wants us now to tell <laughs> A story of witchy glory Spun by fate and also glory of my thumbs. Something wicked this way comes. Open locks, whoever knocks. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. You secret black and midnight hags. What did you do? A deed without, without a name. name. Huh. I entreat you to use all you profess. However you come to know it, answer me. Though you untie the winds and let them fight against the churches, Though the foamy waves confound and swallow up all ships that sail, though new corn you crush and trees blow down and castles topple on their keepers' heads, though palaces and pyramids do bend their heads to their foundations, though the treasure of nature's life sources tumble so completely as to sicken destruction, answer me all of what I ask you. Speak. Demand. We'll answer. Say if thou'd rather hear it from our mouths or, or from, from our master. master. Call him. Let me see him. Pour in Sal's blood that hath eaten her nine piglets. Torn flesh taken from the murder's gallows. Throw into the flame. Come high or low, thyself and duty doth thee show. Tell me. Thou unknown power. He knows thy thought. Hear his speech, but say thou not. Macbeth, Macbeth, Macbeth. Beware Macduff, beware the thane of life. 
dismiss me. Enough. Whatever thou art, for thy good caution, thanks. Thou hast guessed my fear, all right, but one word He more. will not be commanded. He is the never. More potent than the first. Macbeth? Macbeth? Macbeth! Had I three ears, I'd hear thee. Be bloody, bold, and resolute. Laugh to scorn the power of man, for none of woman born shall harm Macbeth. Then live, Macduff. What need I fear of thee? But yet I'll make assurance double sure, and make a bond with fate. He shall not live. So I may tell pale-hearted fear it lies and sleep in spite of thunder. What is this? That rises like the offspring of a king and wears upon his baby brow the round, gold crown of sovereignty. Listen, but speak not to it. Be lion meddled, proud, and take no care who chafes, who frets, or where conspirers are. Macbeth shall not defeated be until great Burnham Wood to high Dunsinane Hill shall rise against him. That will never be. Who can enlist the forest? Bid the tree unfix his earthbound root. Sweet omens, good. Rebellious dead, rise never till the wood of Burnham rise, and our high place to Macbeth shall live life's natural course. Lose his breath to time and mortal custom, yet my heart throbs to no one thing. Tell me, if your art can tell so much, Shall Banquo's offspring ever reign in this kingdom? Seek to know no more. I will be satisfied. Deny me this, and an eternal curse fall on you. Let me know. Why sinks that cauldron? What noise is this? Here's your show. Show his eyes and grieve his heart. Come like shadows so depart. He ate kings, they're your friend. Why stands he at the end? I will be Scotland. I will be Scotland. Thou art too like the spirit of Banquo. Down, thy crown doth sear mine eyeballs. And thy hair, another gold bound brow, so like the first. A third is like the former filthy hags. Why do you show me this? A fourth, burn eyes. What? Will the line stretch out to the crack of doom? Another yet a seventh. I'll see no more. And yet the eighth appears who holds a glass which shows me many more. And some I see carry Scotland's orbs and the scepters of Wales. Horrible sight. Now I see it is true. For the blood-blackened Banquo smiles at me and points at them as his. What? Is this so? Aye, sir, all this is so. But why stands Macbeth thus amazedly? Come, sisters, cheery up its sprites and show the best of our delights. I'll charm the air to give a sound while you perform your frantic round. Let this great king may kindly say our duties gave him welcome pain. <laughs> Where are they? Gone? Let this malignant hour stand so accursed in the calendar. You without, come in. What's your grace's will? Saw you the weird sisters? No, my lord. Came they not by you? No, indeed, my lord. <gasps> Infected be the air whereon they ride, and damned all those that trust them. I did hear the galloping of horse. Who was that came by? Tis two or three, my lord, that bring you word. Macduff is fled to England. Fled to England? Aye, my good lord. <sighs> Time. Thou anticipates my dread exploits. The racing purpose never is undertook unless the deed follows close. From this moment, the very firstlings in my heart shall be the firstlings of my hand. Even now, I must crown my thoughts with acts. As soon as thought, it's done. The castle of Macduff, I will surprise, seize upon Fife, give the edge of the sword to his wife, 
his babes, and all unfortunate souls that trace his family line. No boasting like a fool. This deed I'll do before this purpose cool. Visions be gone. Where are these gentlemen? Come, bring me where they are. Honored Ross, what did my husband do to make him fly? You must have patience, Lady Macduff. He had none. His flight was madness. Though our actions do not, our fears do make us traitors. You know not whether it was Macduff's wisdom or his fear. (laughs) Wisdom! To leave his wife, to leave his babes, his mansion, and his titles in a place from whence himself does fly? He loves us not. He lacks nature's warmth. Even the poor wren, the most diminutive of birds, will fight against the owl for young ones in her nest. All is the fear and nothing is the love. As little is his wisdom, where his flight so runs against all reason. My dearest cuz, I pray you calm yourself. (laughs) Keep faith. Your husband, he is noble, wise, judicious, and best knows the ways of the world. I dare not speak much further. But cruel are the times when we are traitors and do not know ourselves. Believing rumors based on what we fear, yet know not what we fear, but float upon a wild and violent sea, lurching side to side. I take my leave, cuz. Shall not be long, but I'll be here again. Things at the worst will cease, or else climb upward to what they were before. (laughs) My young Macduff, blessing upon you. Fathered he is, and yet he's fatherless. I am so much a fool, should I stay longer. Tears would be my disgrace and your discomfort. I take my leave at once. Young man, your father's dead. What will you do now? How will you live? As birds do, mother. What? With worms and flies. With what I get, I mean, and so do they. Poor bird. Thou have never feared the net nor lime, the set trap nor the snare. Why should I, mother? Poor birds are never hunted. My father is not dead, whatever you say. Yes, he is dead. What wilt thou do for a father? Nay, what will you do for a husband? (laughs) Why, I can buy me twenty at any market. Then you'll buy him to sell again. (laughs) Thou speaks with all thy wit, and yet in faith with wit enough for thee. Was my father a traitor, mother? Aye, That he was. What is a traitor? Why, one that swears and lies. And be all traitors that do so. Every one that does so is a traitor and must be hanged. And must they all be hanged that swear and lie? Every one. Who must hang them? Who? The honest men. Then the liars and swearers are fools. For there are enough liars and swears to beat the honest men and hang them first. Now, God help thee, poor monkey. (laughs) Oh, but what wilt thou do for a father? (laughs) If he were dead, you'd weep for him. If you were not, it were a good sign that I should quickly have a new father. (gasps) Poor prattler, how thou talks. Bless you, fair dame. I am not to you known, though of your state of honor I well know... I fear some danger does approach you nearly. Well, what do you if you will, if you will take a simple man's advice, be not found here. Flee with your little ones. To fright you thus, methinks I am too savage. To not warn you thus were worse cruelty when tis so near upon you. Heaven preserve you. I dare remain no longer. Oh, where then should I fly? I have done no harm. But I remember now I am in this earthly world where to do harm is often laudable. To do good sometimes accounted dangerous folly. Why then, alas, do I put up that womanly defense to say I have done no harm? (gasps) What are these men? Where is your husband? (laughs) I hope in no place so unsanctified where such as thou may find him. He's a traitor. Thou liest, thou shag-haired villain. What? You egg. Young fry of treachery. Ah! He has killed me, mother. 
<laughs> Run away, I pray you. Next Chapter Podcast is proud to present the Play On Podcast series, Coriolanus, in a new modern English verse translation by Sean San Jose. Hear Shakespeare's tragedy about the legendary Roman leader who fell prey to the people and politicians he swore to protect, performed entirely by women and gender non-binary actors. Go to playonpodcast.com to learn more. Keep your friends close and your enemies closer. Honored Macduff, let us seek out some barren shade, and there weep our sad bosoms empty. Prince Malcolm, let's hold fast our deadly swords, and like good men, protect our fallen homeland. Each new morn, new widows howl, new orphans cry, new sorrows strike heaven on the face so it resounds as if it felt with Scotland, and yelled out like the cry of our deep pain. What I believe, I'll wail. What no, believe. And what I can redress as I shall find the time to write, I will. This tyrant, whose name alone blisters tongues, you may see something of him in me, and seek wisely to offer me up. A weak lamb to appease that angry and dishonest god. I am not treacherous. But Macbeth is. A good and virtuous nature may recoil from a royal command. But I shall crave your pardon. My thoughts cannot transform you, Lord Macduff. Angels shine, though brightest Lucifer fell. Though all things foul would wear the face of grace, yet grace must still look fair. I have lost my hopes. Perhaps that same place where I did find my doubts. Why in that danger left you wife and child? Those precious kindred... Those strong knots of love without leave taking. I pray you, let not my suspicions show you dishonor, but my own safeguards. You may be a good man, whatever I might think. Bleed. Bleed, poor country. Great tyranny, set down firmly your base, for goodness dare not check thee. Where thou well thy wrongs, thy title is confirmed. Fare thee well, prince. I would not be the villain that thou thinkst for all of Scotland in that tyrant's grasp and the rich east to boot. Be not offended. Our country sinks beneath his brutal yoke. It weeps. It bleeds. And each new day a gash is added to her wounds. I think, also, there would be hands uplifted for our fight. Here, gracious Edward of England offers me some goodly thousand men. But, for all this... When I shall tread upon the tyrant's head or wear it on my sword, yet my poor country shall have more vices than it had before, suffering in more sundry ways than ever by him that shall succeed. Who should he be? It is myself, I mean, in whom I know all the particulars of vice so implanted that when they shall be cut open, black Macbeth will seem as pure as snow. And the poor state esteem him as a lamb being compared with my limitless harms. <laughs> Not in the legions of horrid hell can come a devil more damned 
in evils to top Macbeth. I grant him smacking of every sin that has a name, but there's no bottom, none in my dire debauchery. Your wives, your daughters, your matrons, and your maids could not fill up the cistern of my lust. And my desire, all chaste and pure impediments, would o'ertake that did oppose my will. Better, Macbeth, than such as I to reign. Excessive indulgence. In nature is a tyranny. It hath wrought the untimely destruction of the happy throne and fall of many kings. But do not fear to take upon you what is yours. You may... Pursue your pleasures in such abundance, and yet seem pure. The time you may so hoodwink. Prince Malcolm, there's no vulture in you hungry enough to devour as many dames as willing to surrender their own virtue to greatness if they feel so inclined. Along with lust, there grows an ill-composed temperament, such an endless avarice that, were I king... I should cut down the nobles for their lands, and my more taking would be as a sauce to make me hunger more, that I should forge quarrels unjust against the good and loyal, destroying them for wealth. This avarice digs deeper, grows with more ruinous root than summer lasting lust, and it hath been the sword which slayed our kings. Yet, do not fear. Scotland has the sources to fill up your will fully on her own. All can be endured when weighed with your graces. But I have none, Macduff. The king becoming graces, like justice, honesty, patience, courage, I have no relish of them, but abound in the division of each and every crime, enacting them many ways. Nay, had I power, I should pour the sweet milk of heaven into hell, uproot our universal peace, crushing all unity on earth. <sighs> Scotland. Scotland. If such a one be fit to govern, speak. I am as I have spoken. Fit to govern? You're not fit to live. Oh, nation miserable. An unentitled tyrant, bloody sceptered. When shall Scotland see wholesome days again? Since the true inheritor of your throne, by his own admission, stands accursed and does defame his family? Your royal father was a most sainted king, the queen that bore thee, often knelt to God, then stood on her feet, died to be reborn every day she lived. Fare you well, Malcolm. These evils you recount into mine ears have banished me from Scotland. Oh, my breast, thy hope ends here. Macduff, your noble passion... Child of integrity has from my soul wiped the blackened doubts, reconciled my thoughts to thy good truth and honor. Here renounce the taints and blames I laid upon myself as strangers to my nature. I am yet to know a woman. Never broke my word. Scarcely have coveted what was my own, at no time broke my faith, would not betray the devil to his fellow, and delight in truth as much as life. My first false speaking was now about myself. What I am truly is thine, and my poor country's to command. Whither, indeed, before thy landing here, old seaward, with ten thousand warlike men all armed at the ready, was setting forth. Together, now, we'll better the chance of success as great as our quarrel is just. Why are you silent? Such welcome and unwelcome things at once. Tis hard to reconcile. <laughs> <laughs> See who comes here. My countryman, but yet I know him not. My ever-gentle cousin Ross. Welcome hither. 
I know him now. Good God, with speed remove the means that makes us strangers. <laughs> Welcome, cousin. <laughs> Sir, amen. Stand Scotland where it did? Our poor, poor country. Almost afraid to know itself. It cannot be called our mother, but our grave. Where nothing but those who know nothing are seen to smile. Where sighs and groans and shrieks that rend the air are heard, not heeded. Where violent sorrow seems a common rhapsody. The dead man's nail rings there, but for whom? As good men's lives expire for the flowers wilt in their caps, dying before they sicken. Oh, retold all too well, and yet too true. What's the newest grief? That's an hour's age past his, is the speaker. Each minute teems a new one. How does my wife? Why, well. And all my children? Well, too. The tyrant has not battered at their peace. No. <sighs> they were well at peace when I did leave them. Be not a miser with your speech. How ghost? When I came hither to transport the tidings, which heartbroken I have borne, there ran a rumor of many rebellious fellows now armed, which I then so witnessed with mine own eyes when I then saw the tyrant's army afoot. Now's the time for help. Seeing you in Scotland would create soldiers. Mm. Make our women fight to ditch their dire distresses. Be it their comfort, we are coming there. Mm. Gracious England has lent us 10,000 men and good seaward, an older and a better soldier, none that Christendom gives out. Would I could answer this comfort with the like. But I have words that would be howled out in the desert air, where hearing should not hold them. What concern they? The general cause? Or is it one man's grief due to some single breast? No mind that is just must in it share some woe, though the main part pertains to you alone, Macduff. If it be mine, keep it not from me. Quickly! Let me have it. Let not your ears despise my tongue forever, which shall possess them with the heaviest sound that ever yet they heard. <sighs> I guess that it. Your castle is surprised. Your wife and babes savagely slaughtered. <sighs> to relate the manner were on the bloody mound of these murdered deer, to add the death of you. <sighs> Merciful heaven. Don't just pull your hat upon your sad brows. Give sorrow words. The grief unspoke will ache. Whispers the o'erfraught heart and bids it break. My children too? Wife, children, servants, all that could be found. And I, I wasn't home with them. My wife killed too. I have said, be comforted. Let's make us medicines of our great revenge to cure this deadly grief. He has no children. All my pretty ones. Did you say all? Oh, hell, Kai. All. What? All. My pretty chickens and their dam at one fell swoop. Dispute it as a man. I shall do so. But I must also feel it as a man. I can remember things as once they were the that were most precious to me. Did heaven look on and would not take their side? Sinful Macduff. They were all struck for thee, vile that I am, not for their own demerits, but for mine. Slaughter fell on their souls. Heaven rest them now. Be this the whetstone of your sword. Let grief convert to anger. Blunt not the heart. Enrage it. I could play the woman with mine eyes and braggart with my tongue. But gentle heavens, cut short all intermission. Face to face, bring thou this fiend of Scotland and myself. Within my sword's lethal length, set him if he escape. Heaven forgive him too. This tune goes manly. Come, go we to the king. Our army is ready. Our lack is nothing but our leave. 
Macbeth is ripe for shaking, and the powers above put on their instruments. Receive what cheer you may. His night is long that never sees the day. Perceive no truth in your report. When was it she last sleepwalked? Since His Majesty went into the field, I have seen her rise from her bed, throw her nightgown upon her, unlock her closet, take forth paper, fold it, write upon it, read it, afterwards seal it, and again return to bed. Yet all this while in a most fast sleep. Mm, a great perturbation in nature to receive at once the benefit of sleep and yet create the appearance of being awake. In this slumbery agitation, besides her walking and other actual movements, what at any time have you heard her say? <gasps> that, sir, which I will not repeat after her. You may to me, and tis most fitting you should. Neither to you nor anyone, having no witness to confirm my speech. <gasps> oh! Lo, you! Here she comes! This is her very guise, and upon my life, fast asleep. Observe her. Stand close. How came she by that candle? Why, it sits beside her. She has light by her continually. Tis her command. You see, her eyes are open. Aye, but their scents are shut. What is it she does now? Look! How she rubs her hands. It is an accustomed action with her to seem thus washing her hands. I have known her continue in this a quarter of an hour. Yet here's the spot. Hark, she speaks. I will write down what comes from her to satisfy my remembrance the more strongly. Out! Damn spot! Out, I say! One, two... Why, then, tis time to do it. Hell is murky. Fie, my lord, fie! A soldier and a feared. What need we fear? Who knows it? When none can call our power to account. Yet who would have thought the old man to have so much blood in him? Do you note that? The thane of Fife had a wife. Where is she now? What? Will these hands ne'er be clean? No more of that, my lord, no more of that you mar all with this twitching. Come, come, you have known what you should not. She has spoke what she should not, I am sure of that. Heaven knows what she has known. Here's the smell of blood still. All the perfumes of Arabia will not sweeten this little hand. Oh, oh, no! Oh. Oh, what a sigh is there. The heart is sorely charged. I would not have such a heart in my bosom, even for the crown that comes with it. Well, well, well. Pray God it be well, sir. This disease is beyond my practice. Yet I have known those which have walked in their sleep oh. who have died holily in their beds. Wash your hands, put on your nightgown, look not so pale. I tell you yet again, Banquo's buried. He cannot come out of his grave. Even so? To bed, to bed, there's knocking at the gate. Come, 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 give me your hand. What's done cannot be undone. To bed, to bed, to bed. Will she go now to bed? Directly. Oh, foul whisperings are abroad. Unnatural deeds do breed unnatural troubles. 
Infected minds to their death pillows will discharge their secrets. More needs she the divine than the physician. Oh, God. God forgive us all. Look after her. Remove from her the means of all self-harm and still keep eyes upon her. So, good night. My mind, she has baffled and amazed my sight. I think, but dare not speak. Good night, good doctor. English army is near, led on by Malcolm, Duncan's banished heir, and bereaved Macduff. Revenge is burning them, for their dear causes would, with its fearsome, bloodthirsty alarm, raise up the stone dead man. Near Burnham Wood shall we well meet them, where we once proudly stood. <laughs> Your true fate unfolds, fatherless Fleance. What does the dark killing tyrant, aunties? Great Dun's name he strongly fortifies. Some say he's mad. Others that hate him less do call it a valiant fury. But for certain, he cannot buckle his disordered cause within the belt of rule. Now does he feel his secret murder sticking on his hands. Every minute revolts reprove his treason. Those he commands move only in command, but not for love. Not for love. Not for love. Not for love. <laughs> <laughs> now does he feel his title hang loose about him like a giant's robe? Upon a dwarfish thief! <laughs> <laughs> Now march we on, to give obedience where tis truly owed. With Malcolm pour we in our country's purge, sanguine medicine for our sick kingdom. Each drop of us water, much as it needs, to dew the sovereign flowers and drown the weeds. Make we our march towards Burnham! Me too will march towards Burnham. <laughs> Oh, bring me no more reports. Let them fly all. Till Burnham Wood removed the dancing and I cannot pale with fear. What's the boy Malcolm? Was he not born of woman? The spirits that know all mortal consequence have pronounced me thus. Fear not, Macbeth. No man that's born of woman shall e'er have power upon thee. Then fly, false thanes, and mingle with the English libertines. The mind I sway by and the heart I bear shall never sag with doubt nor shake with fear. <clears throat> oh, the devil damn thee black, thou cream-faced loon. Where got thou that goose look? Uh, there is ten thousand geese, villain. Soldiers, sir. Next Chapter Podcast is proud to present the Play On Podcast series, King Lear. I'll stand in honor of the royal family. Starring Keith David. Our most dear and honored King Lear. In a new modern English verse translation by Marcus Gardley. Tell me, dearest daughters, which of you shall say she loves me most? But you did not obey our father and therefore deserve the punishment handed down to you. Hear Shakespeare's epic tragedy, performed by some of the most accomplished actors of our time. Only the grave now can bring me peace. Go to playonpodcast.com to learn more.
there's a sickness that comes with age. Anyone can see how this world works. Just look with your ears. Have a splendid life. Ten thousand uh, geese, villain. Soldiers, sir. Go prick thy face and make bloody thy fear, thou lily-livered boy. What soldiers, fool? Death of thy soul. Those linen cheeks of thine are counselors to fear. What soldiers, milk face? The English force so please you. Take thy face hence. Satan! I am sick at heart when I behold... Satan, I say! This push will cheer me ever or dethrone me now. I have lived long enough. My way of life has fallen dry into the desert, the yellow leaf, and that which should accompany old age like honor, love, obedience, troops of friends, I must not look to have, but in their stead, curses. <laughs> Soft, but deep. Breathing false honor which the heart would gladly deny, but dare not. Satan! What's your grace's pleasure? What news more? All is confirmed, my lord, which was reported. I'll fight till from my bones my flesh be hacked. Give me my armor. Tis not needed yet. I'll put it on. Send out more horses, skirt the country round, hang those that talk of fear. Give me mine armor. How does your patient, doctor? Not so sick, my lord, as she is troubled with disturbing visions that keep her from her rest. Well, cure her of that! Canst thou not minister to a mind diseased? Pluck from the memory a rooted sorrow, raise out the written troubles of the brain, and with some sweet, oblivious antidote, cleanse the stuffed bosom of that perilous stuff which weighs upon the heart? Therein the, the patient must minister to herself. Well, throw potions to the dogs, I'll none of it! Come put mine armor on. Give me my lance. Satan, send out. Doctor, the fanes fly from me. Come, sir. Hurry. If thou couldst, doctor, test the water of my land, find her disease, and purge it to a sound and pristine health, I'd applaud thee to the very echo that should applaud again. Pull it off, I say. What rhubarb, senar, what purgative drug would cleanse these English hints? Hear thou of them. Aye, my good lord. Your royal preparation makes us hear some. Now bring it on to me. I will not be afraid of death and pain till Burnham Forest come to Dunsinane. Were I from Dunsinane away and clear, prophet again should hardly draw me here. Cousins, I hope the days are near at hand that we'll be safe in our beds. We doubt it nothing. What wood is this before us? The wood of Burnham. Let every soldier hew him down a bow and bear it before him. Thereby shall we conceal the numbers of our men and make discovery falsely in report of us. It, it shall, shall be, be done. done. We learn nothing new other than the confident tyrant keeps still in Dunsinane and will endure our encampment before it. Tis his main hope. For where there is advantage to be given, both high and low have revolted against him, and none serve with him but those enforced things, whose hearts are absent too. Let honest judgment attend the true outcome, and put we on industrious soldiership. The time approaches that will with due decision make us know what we shall say we have, and what we owe. Speculative thoughts leave unsure hopes to fate, but for sure results, steel must arbitrate. Towards which? Advance the war! Yeah! Hang out our banners on the outward walls. Cry as still they come. 
A castle's strength will scoff at any siege. Here, let them lie. Till famine and the fever eat them up. Were they not forced with those that should be ours, we might have met them fearless face to face and beat them fiercely back home. What is that noise? It is the cry of women, my good lord. I have almost forgot the taste of fears. Time has been my senses would have cooled to hear a night shriek, and my head of hair would at a frightening tail stand and stir as life were in it. I have supped with slain horrors. Such dread familiar to my slaughterous thoughts cannot startle me. Wherefore was that cry? The queen, my lord, is dead. She should have died hereafter. There would have been time for such a word. Tomorrow, and tomorrow, and tomorrow. Creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time and all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Out. Out. Brief candle. Life is but a walking shadow. A poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury and signifying nothing. comes to use thy tongue, thy story, quickly. Gracious, my lord, I shall report to you that which I say I saw, but know not how to do it. Just say, sir. As I stand my watch upon the hill, I look toward Burnham, and ere long, methought, the wood began to move. <sighs> Liar and slave! Let me endure your wrath, if it be not so. Within this three miles, may you see it coming. I say, a moving grove. If thou speak'st false, upon the next tree shalt thou hang alive, till famine cling thee. If thy speech be such, I care not if thou dost for me as much. I reign in resolution and begin to doubt the equivocation of the fiend that lies like truth. Fear not till Burnham Wood do come to Dunsinane, and now a wood comes toward Dunsinane. Arm, arm, and fight. If this which he avouches does appear, there is no flying hence, nor tarrying here. I begin to be a weary of the sun, and wish the estate of the world were now undone. Ring the alarm bell. Blow wind, come rack. At least we'll die with harness on our back. Ha! Now, near enough. Your leafy screens throw down and show like those you are! You, worthy uncle, shall with my cousin, your right noble son, lead our first battle. Worthy Macduff, and we shall take upon what else remains to do, according to our order. Fare you well. Do we but find the tyrant's power tonight? Let us be beaten, if we cannot fight! Make all our trumpets speak. Give them all breath. Those clamorous harbingers of blood and death! They have tied me to a stake, I cannot fly. But bear-like I must fight the course. What's he that was not born of woman? Such a one am I to fear, or none. <laughs> what is thy name? Thou shalt be afraid to hear it. No, though thou callst thyself a hotter name than any is in hell. My name's Macbeth. <gasps> the devil himself could not pronounce a title more hateful to mine ear. No, nor more fearful. Thou liest, abhorred tyrant. With my sword, I'll prove the lie thou speakest. Thou wast born of woman, but swords I smile at, weapons laugh to scorn. Brandished by manlets of a woman born. That way the noises. 
tyrant, show thy face. If thou beest slain, and with no stroke of mine, my wife and children's ghosts will haunt me still. I cannot strike at wretched men whose arms are hired to bear their lances. Neither thou, Macbeth, or else my sword, with an unbloodied edge, I sheathe again undeeded. There thou shouldst be. By this great clatter, one of greatest note seems proclaimed. Let me find him, fortune, and more I beg not. This way, my lord, the castle is gently rendered. The tyrant's people on both sides do fight. The noble thanes do bravely in the war. The day almost gives itself to you, and little is to do. We have met with foes who, as friends, will not strike us. Enter, sir, the castle. Why should I play the Roman fool and die on mine own sword? Whilst I see the living, gashed as I will grant them. Turn. turn. Hellhound, turn. Of all men else, I have avoided thee. But get thee back. My soul is too much charged with blood of thine already. I have no words. My voice is in my sword. Thou bloodier villain than words can call thee out. Thou wastes thy work, as if blindly thrusting thy keen sword through the vaporous air to make me bleed. Let fall thy blade on vulnerable crests. I bear a charmed life which must not yield to one of woman born. Despair thy charm, and let the devil whom thou still hast served tell thee. Macduff was from his mother's womb untimely ripped. <laughs> Be the tongue that tells me so, for it hath cowed my very manliness. And be these midnight hags no more believed that deal false with us in a double sense that keep the word of promise to our ear and break to our hope. I'll not fight with thee. Then yield thee. Coward, and live to be the laughing stock of the time. We'll have thee, as our rarer monsters are, blazed on a banner and written below. Here may you see the tyrant. I will not yield to kiss the ground before young Malcolm's feet and to be baited with the rabble's curse, though Burnham would become to Dunsinane. And thou, my foe, being of no woman born, Yet I will try the last. Before my body I throw my warlike shield. Lay on, Macduff. And damned be him that first cries. Hold. Enough. Would the friends we miss were safe arrived? Some have died here, and yet by these I see. So great a day as this is worth such loss. Hail, King Malcolm, for so thou art. Behold, here stands the usurper's cursed head. <gasps> the time is free. I see thee circled by thy kingdom's pearl that speak my salutation in their minds whose voices I desire aloud with mine. Hail, King of Scotland! Hail, King of Scotland! Yes! Hail, 
called the King of Scotland. Fleance. What? Hail the King, Banquo's son. I'm here. All hail Fleance. Yes, hail. We shall not spend a large expense of time before we reckon with your several loves and make us even with you. My thanes and kinsmen, henceforth be earls, the first that ever Scotland in such an honor named. <laughs> yes. yes. What we must do is to plant anew in this freed earth by calling home our exiled friends abroad who fled the snares of watchful tyranny. Then bring forth to justice the cruel ministers of this dead butcher and his fiend-like queen, who, as tis thought, by self and violent hands, took her own life. This, and what needful else that calls upon us, by the grace of grace, we will perform in measure, time, and place. So thanks to all at once, whom by next moon, here we invite to see us crowned at Schoon. <laughs> So thanks to all at once. Who by next moon? Thee we invite to see. Who will be crowned at Schoon? Of a forest snake in the cauldron boil and bake. Eye of newt and toe of frog, full of bat and tongue of dog. For a charm of powerful trouble, like a head broth boil and bubble. Double, double toil and trouble, fire burning cauldron bubble. Double, double toil and trouble, fire burning cauldron bubble. Double, double toil and trouble, fire burning cauldron bubble. Double, double toil and trouble, fire burn and cauldron bubble. The Play On podcast series, Macbeth, was translated into modern English verse by Migdalia Cruz and directed by Edward Torres. Episode scripts were adapted and produced by Catherine Eaton. Sound design, mix engineering, and original music composition by David Molina. Sound engineer, Daniel Ben Shimon. Executive producer, Michael Goodfriend. Senior producer, Miriam Lauba. Managing producer, Robert Cappadona. Coordinating producer, Taylor Bailey. Casting by the Telsey office, Karen Castle, CSA, and Ada Karamanian. The cast is as follows. Armando Riesco as Macbeth. Sabrina Guevara as Lady Macbeth. Chinaza Uche as Macduff. Jordan Barbour as Banquo. Bernard White as Duncan. Daniel Jose Molina as Malcolm. Flor Delis Perez as Lady Macduff. Barzan Akavan as Ross and the Porter. Annie Hank as Lennox. Elijah Goodfriend as Macduff's son, featuring Manila Luzon, Monet Exchange, and Miss Peppermint as the witches. Also featuring David Watson on the bagpipes. Voice and text coach, Rebecca Clark Carey. Equipment and recording engineer, Tommy Freed. Sound effects assistant, Ben Welty. 
production assistant, Benjamin Goodfriend. The senior manager of business operations and partnerships at Next Chapter Podcasts is Sally Cade Holmes. The play on podcast series Macbeth is produced by Next Chapter Podcasts and is made possible by the generous support of the Hits Foundation. Visit playonpodcasts.com for more about the Play On Podcast series. Visit playonshakespeare.org for more about Play On Shakespeare. Hear more about the Play On Shakespeare podcast series by listening to bonus content at playonpodcasts.com, where you'll find interviews with the artists, producers, and engineers who brought it all to life. And don't forget to wash your hands. Wow.